Okay, the message this week is unto the glory of the Lord from 2 Kings 5, 1 through 3. I want to I want to read this uh, this text. Uh, it, it's kind of in two pieces, so I'm going to have to read one piece and then the other. But in 2 Kings 5, 1, it talks about Nahum, the captain of the army, the king of Syria. And it said he was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And many of you may know this story. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of, Israel, out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Nahum's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would that my Lord were all, it would that my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would cure him of his leprosy. So, uh, just quickly on this part, we're talking about Nahum, a captain of the Syrian army. Um, he's, a, he's a powerful leader of the Syrian army. He's got leprosy. And uh, interestingly enough, it says here that the Lord had, uh, because the Lord by him had delivered uh, unto Syria many nations. And, and it's interesting because he is, uh, he's, not from, uh, he's not from Israel. He's actually the enemy of Israel. And if you go back, you find that there's times when Israel needed to be punished. And in order for them to be punished, um, God would use other nations around them to do that. And although Syria was their enemy, and still is, I mean, we're still hearing about wars with Syria and the, and the complex things that are going on over there now. And I think they just reported this week that they thought 40,000 had been killed, and now it's 60,000, they're saying is the more accurate number in, in the, the, the revolution and the rebellion that's going on right now. It's pretty messy. And, um, and they continue to be an enemy of Israel after all these years, but um, but the Lord had, had actually given him, uh, given deliverance unto Syria. It helped him, it helped Nahum fight the battle. And so in, in the next couple of verses, it says in 2 Kings 5, 4 through 6, and one went in and told his Lord, saying, now and one went in, this is Nahum, goes in to the king. And we could say, and Nahum went in and told his Lord or the king, saying, thus and thus said the maid, that is a land of Israel. I thought that was interesting. But so many times things are exactly quoted. And here, I don't know why, but it says, it just kind of says, and this girl said this and this. You know, thus and thus said this little girl. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and he took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold. Uh, those two things combined in today's value is uh, well over $100,000, probably closer to $200,000. So he took about $200,000 with him, and then uh, 10 changes of raiment. So he took uh, 10 fancy uh, gowns with him, and uh, you know, men's you know, robes and valuable, very valuable robes. So this guy's going with a couple hundred thousand dollars to get healed of leprosy. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto you, behold, I have, I have with it sent Nahum my servant unto you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And so he's carrying this letter and a couple hundred thousand dollars and probably a whole army of guys with him. And he shows up to the king of Israel, which they had dominated for several years uh, because the Lord had given them victory. Uh, and... and he gives him this letter that says, "Heal this guy of leprosy," because we heard from this little girl that we cap that, that, that we had, that we had gotten from that we captured from Israel that there's somebody here that heals these people. And here's an interesting thing: Second Kings five seven says, "And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man does send unto me a cure?'" to cure a man of his leprosy? And therefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks to quarrel against me. He's saying, he's saying the king is trying to entrap me. He's trying to trick me by calling me to heal this guy of leprosy. He's trying to trick me into, into healing this guy uh, and not being able to heal him. And then somehow use that to, to punish us, Israel, who is already under the dominance of, of Syria. What's this guy trying to do to me? 
But here's the interesting thing. He didn't send him for the king to heal him. He sent him for Elisha to heal him. He sent him for the prophet of Israel to heal him. But the king, is he's like all into himself. And how many of us, and we have to really look at that, when, when God calls us into a healing ministry, He calls us, he calls us to, to pray for somebody, to, and, and immediately we say, Oh God, why are you telling me this? It's just going to embarrass me. Uh, what if they don't get healed? I can't heal them. I'm not God. And we mentally immediately go where this guy has went. And it's all about us and me. And we are the central focus. Do you see that here? It's saying, what do I do? What do I do? He's trying to trick me. He's trying to, he's trying to start a fight with me. So I get in trouble with him. So he can come down here and, and, and war against me. He sent this army with this letter. And he sent it with the captain of his most powerful captain of the Syrian armory. And what's going to happen? Oh, look at me. Look at me. Oh, me, 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 me. And that's what's going on in Christianity today. Oh God, I can't heal anybody. I haven't fasted and prayed a lot. I, I, haven't, I haven't made the sacrifices I need to make. I, I just, I, I don't know what to do. God, I can't do this. Don't ask me to heal people. So we don't do any of that. The church doesn't pray for people. We don't lay hands on people. We don't ask God to heal them because we're into me. It's all me, me, me. And, and, and then in 5.8 it says, and, and it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? What, what are you getting upset about? What, it's not you? What, what's going on here? And Jesus could say the same thing to us Christians. What are you all upset about? Why are you so focused on yourself and, and your inability to pray for people and see healing take place? You're not the healer, I am. <coughs> Excuse me. And so he says, Let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Let him come to me, and he'll see that there is power in Israel, that the power of God resides in Israel. Let the people that are sick come to the church and see that there is the power of God. And it's not me it's not me as a televangelist that, oh, send me, your, send me your money and I'll send you these little cloths and you'll get healed. And the focus isn't on an individual. The focus is on Jesus Christ. And of course, Elisha means the Lord is my salvation. So here we've got a picture of Elisha saying, send him to me so that he knows there's a prophet. See, if, if the Christians would get outside themselves and say, send the sick people here, we'll pray for them and we'll see them get healed. And, and will everyone get healed? That's not our issue. It's not our issue to, to do like the king of Israel did and get all wrapped up and say, Oh, no, 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 I can't do this. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want, to, I don't want people to think I'm stupid. I don't want them to think I'm a religious fanatic. So don't, don't, don't do that. And Elisha says, it's not, it's not you, king. It's not you. You know, the king was a child of God. The king was a child of God through Abraham and David. This king was a child of God. We're children of God, and it's not us, and we need to get over it. We need to get over the embarrassment. We need to get over the, the potential failure if we pray for somebody. We've got to be like loaded and ready, cocked and ready, and, and able to say, you need prayer, I'll pray for you. It's up to God. I don't, I'm not the healer, but I'll certainly pray for you, and we'll watch and see what God does. And he said, and he says, this will be proof that there is a God in Israel. And that he's a powerful God. This guy came with, with all expectations that he would be healed. Nahum did. He heard from this little girl. A little girl says, there's a guy, you know, people are desperate. They're desperate for healing. They want to be healed. They're desperate for healing. We can't make him any promises. We're not the healer. Jesus Christ is. But he wants to operate through us. And what the church does is we deny it. We make up stories about, oh, this is dispensation and that's not now and that's for some other time and all that kind of nonsense. It's just, it's just excuses no different than the king of Israel. Mark 16, 20 says, and this is about the church, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. This is the church. The church is supposed to go forth, preach, and pray for people, 
so that the signs will confirm that what the message is that we have about Jesus Christ is real. You know why there's all this doubt and unbelief in the world now in the United States? is because the church isn't the church. The church is trying to be a country club. The, the church is trying to be a, a psychoanalyst. The church is trying to fix people's problems. But not trying to heal them, not trying to cast out demons, not doing what we were called to do, but doing something that's more politically correct, something that's more acceptable, because we don't want the rejection. We don't want people talking about us and saying that we're funny, weird people. Well, Elisha was a funny, weird person. When he first got the, the, the robe of Elijah, he, he went into the city and he, he prayed that the water would be, uh, would, would be pure and, and, and he prayed and the water changed and everybody was healthy and whole and, and uh, the water was super and they could build the city around it and, and everything changed. He threw some salt in the water. I don't know why that affected it, but the wells all cleared up. And then these young boys came and said, Hey, Baldy, Baldy, when are you going up? These young kids chased after him. A whole handful of young kids chased after him and said, Hey, Baldy, when are you going up? Because they'd heard about Elijah. So they're mocking him, saying, Hey, Baldy, when are you going up? Elijah went up. Now when are you going up? And they were making fun of him. And he called, and, and people struggle with this scripture, but it says that he, that he called for their destruction, and a bear came down. It, it said a mad mother bear came down and, uh, and tore him to bits. I think it was like 40 kids. I may be wrong, but it could be for you kids. But 2 Kings 5.19, or 5, 9 through 10, it, it, it's interesting what happens next. So Nahum came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger on him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come again to you, and you will be clean. Wow. Here's what you do. Here's what you do, Nahum, is you go and you, you wash seven times, in the Jordan River, and you're going to be fine. Your leprosy is going to go away. But look what Nam does. But Nam was angry. Next verse, 11 and 12. But Nam was angry and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and, and far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Why? May I not wash in them? And be clean. So he turned away and he went away in a rage. You know, this is so typical. This is so typical. People, we, we, we talk about this is what you need to do to get healed. You need to get delivered of this. You know, if you're having, uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday. I couldn't say anything. Born again Christian. And I couldn't say anything because I knew how they'd respond. Born again Christian talking about all kinds of back trouble and back pain and, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, uh, and, and my tendency was to say, well, the reason that you have all this trouble is because the Bible says that when you're jealous and angry and critical, that you're going to have trouble with your bones. You're going to have rotting bones. And I went on to say, you know, I had that once and I was, God healed me of it. And I wanted to go on and tell this person that, that he healed me of it because I got released of those emotions that were not biblical, and if I get rid of them, then my bones will stop rotting. And they said, oh, well, you couldn't have had the same thing. And I said, I absolutely did. Exactly the same thing. In fact, uh, an orthopedic surgeon did MRIs on me and said, that's what I have. The words that just came out of your mouth of your disease that you have, I had that, I had it for 12 years. I couldn't even sleep at night. It hurt so bad. I lived on aspirin and, and ibuprofen and Motrin and everything else. And it still didn't help. Had the same exact thing. Well, you don't get healed of that. That doesn't get better. That's what this person told me. And then they went on to tell me how they also have this other disease where the, the, their backbones are growing shut. It's called stenosis or something of the spine. And the, the backbones are growing shut and pinching all the nerves. And eventually they'll be totally paralyzed. And I'm like, I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't want to talk to that person because if I tell them this scripture that I'm just working on, and I felt like maybe I'm supposed to tell them. Most, maybe I'm supposed to tell them. They don't believe in miraculous healing. They believe that God is, uh, has some plan where he, he punishes some people and other people and he doesn't. I'll tell you what punishes us. It's, it's a denial of the Word of God. 
He says that these emotions, these feelings that you harbor inside of you are causing your disease. And if you get rid of them, then you'll get rid of them. And so, Nahum is told by the prophet Elisha, go down and wash in the Jordan River. And you know what he says? My rivers are better than your rivers. Right away, we hit the point of Nahum's problem. Why does he have leprosy? Because he thinks he's better than everybody else. He's got leprosy, but he's a darn good captain. And, and he reports right to the king. He's not even a general, but he's a captain of the army and he reports right to the king. And the king sent him here. And this guy ought to come out, this guy, this old rough, raggedy, dusty, dirty, bald guy ought to come out and wave his hand or do something because I'm important. I'm important and he should do something, something demonstrative that everybody can see. And he tells me, go take a bath. Not just take a bath, take seven baths. Well, all my army's watching. And I'm supposed to go in this river, I'm supposed to dunk in this river seven times, I'm going to come out with leprosy and I'm going to lose all my credibility with my army. I mean, these are the thoughts this guy must be thinking. I'm not going to do that. I can take a bath back when back in Damascus. What am I taking a bath here for? He's probably thinking I'm taking a lot of baths trying to wash this leprosy away and it's not gone away. Why is this going to work? See, and we can pinpoint to Christians and say, here's your biblical problem. Here's why you have the issues that you have because you've got these things that you won't let go of. You won't identify them as a real problem in your life and then attack them and get rid of them. You won't do that. You harbor them. Well, that's me. You know, this person had this unique back problem. No, it was exactly the same back problem I had. Well, you probably just went to a doctor and they, they assumed that you had that. No, I went to a, 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 an orthopedic surgeon and he told me what the chances of, of him fixing it were and I decided not to do it. Because he went through this lineage. He read me this thing, before we operate on your back, this is what I have to tell you. There's a possibility that I'll do this operation and it won't help you. There's a possibility I'll do this and he's going like 25% possibility that I'll do this operation and it won't improve your situation at all. 25% uh, possibility that I'll, that I'll do this, uh, this, this operation and you'll get worse. And there's a 25% chance that, that, that you won't even be able to walk when I'm done with it. And then there's this 1% chance or 10% chance or whatever it is that you die of the anesthesia and you don't even come out of the thing and you're dead. And I said, hmm, I think I can put up with my back problems given the odds that you're presenting me. I get better odds in the casino than I'm getting from this doctor who's a specialist at it. And he's, and he's probably in his 60s at the time. I mean, he'd been doing it for many, many years. And he knew his stuff. I could tell you his name. I won't. He's retired now. But I said, no, I'm not doing it. And I never knew that God was going to heal me. And a few years later, God completely healed me of it. And it went away. I've never had it since. It tries to come back a little once in a while. I don't. I just don't like it. Like when I'm shoveling snow or something like that. I get out of here. I don't want this. I don't want rotting to the bones. But you can't tell the church that. You can't tell people that because they're like Nahum. They get angry. He had to rage. He yelled. And and what's interesting is when he when he raged, you're going to see in a minute that his servant went to him and talked to him. And it just blows my mind that the servant he had the guts to go and talk to him when he's ranting and raving. So let's go home. Why did I even come to this stupid place? He's probably thinking, I'm going to go back and get in the face of that little girl that told me this crap. But in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, Jesus, well, God said this. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God said, I'll do things my way. I'm the commander of this whole thing. Elisha said, you want to get healed? This is what you do. The Lord spoke to me, and this is what I'm supposed to do. If the Lord told me to come out and make some big fall around, wave my hands over you, then that's what I do. But the Lord told me to have you go dunk in the Jordan River seven times. Go do that, and you'll be healed. See, we can't say that. The church can't say that. Number one, we, we aren't really good at knowing what the Bible says anyhow. I mean, I've talked about the, the you know, the jealousy and, and these emotions, these bad critical emotions that we have cause rotting of the bones. Cause rotting of the bones. 
Does anybody know where that is? Proverbs? That's probably pretty close. We know it's there, but how well do we know it? And if that's one that everybody knows, because everybody knows somebody that's jealous and you think, ah, their bones are going to rot. You know, it, it's we all know that text verbatim, but we don't know where it is probably. Well, how can we tell these people what their, their problems are if we can't address them? Even Jesus asked the, the he asked the, the, the demons to tell them their names. Who are you? I'm Legion. You know, if we get in a place where we can walk up to somebody and says, oh, I got this problem or that, I'd probably say, okay, demon, who's in there and what you doing to these people? And the demon would speak back. We're not there. But these are, these are some things to aspire to. These are some directions to go towards. There's some good books. We've talked about Henry Wright. We've talked about there's some good books out there that, that go into detail of, of his research. Kind of almost, I don't want to call it scientific research, but his, his careful research of the Word of God to determine what links uh, various diseases to different things. That would be a place to start. Got rid of my heart issues. Got me healed on a weekend. On a weekend from, from uh, an almost closed artery needing a stent to you're fine, you can go home. Off the operating table. Later to have the doctor say, I think you received a miracle. You received a healing is his, his words. And he's not, he's not, as far as I know, he's not a born again Christian. But God's thoughts are way above our thoughts. And we're trying to reason. We're trying to reason just like man. This doesn't make any sense. I can take a bath anymore. In fact, Jordan isn't that clean. He's reasoning instead of obeying. Instead of acting on what the Word of God says, he's rationalizing it. And he's going to keep his disease. But he lucks out, and he has a servant that will stand up to him. And in 2 Kings 5, 13 through 14, it says... 2 Kings uh, 5, 13 through 14, he says, And his servant came near and spoke unto him. Now he comes up, he says, This servant has got to have some courage. He's got to be a real friend. And he's got to really be concerned about this guy because he could lose his head over this. And he walks up to, to Nahum and he, and he speaks to him kind of softly, kind of whispers to him. And he said, My father, if the prophet had bid you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? If he had asked you to do some incredible thing, would you have not done it? How much rather than when he says to you, wash and be clean, why not give it a shot? Why not give it a shot? And it says, then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. That guy could have, could have died of leprosy. He would have lost limbs, fingers, you know, hands, arms, eventually his legs and his feet, his toes, and, and had a horrible suffering life. But he was very fortunate that he had somebody that just kind of blew in his ear and said, you know, this might work. You come all this way, you may as well give it a shot. And he went down and did it, and he was healed. You know, I said this a couple weeks ago in here. I said, you know, if, if we pray for somebody, there's a shot they might get healed. If we know what the Bible says about their disease, then we have a better chance. Um, unless they go into a rage and don't, don't want to hear that they have a problem that's creating their situation. But, but if we don't pray for them at all, then they've got no chance, zero chance of God healing them, at least through us. If we pray for them and they don't get healed, so what? We prayed for them. We expected God to move. And He did or didn't, and that's His business. But we need to pray for them. But we need to pray word for them. We can't go up to them and say, Oh, I want to pray for you. I noticed that you're in a wheelchair. I'd like to pray for you. Uh, you know, and you pray some kind of a, Now I lay me down to sleep prayer with them. Or, Oh, give them the courage to, to live through this you know, being in a wheelchair the rest of their life. You know, sometimes I wonder, if we go up to them and pray for them to have the courage to be in this wheelchair the rest of their lives, God might answer their prayer. 
or answer our prayer. They might be in that wheelchair the rest of their life, and they just might be a little more content with it because we prayed with them. But what if we get up to them and say, you know, I just, I just want to pray for you to be healed. You know, um, in the Bible it says this is what we're supposed to do. I'm just trying to be obedient to God, and I would love to see you come out of that wheelchair. And they could say something like, ah, not interested, don't want to try it. Then, okay, that's fine. That, that was their choice. They might get angry at you and say, ah, oh, I don't believe in that stuff, you know. So what, what's the difference? What is really the difference? It's us. It's just like the king of Israel. It's me. I don't want to pray for that person because they might reject me and people might look at me and laugh at me and people might say funny things about me and, um, and, and there's too much at risk here for me. That's what the king of Israel said. There's too much at risk. It wasn't even talking about him. We're not talking about us. We're talking about Jesus Christ operating through us. The power of the Holy Spirit. The dunamis power of the Holy Spirit operating through the church. <coughs> 2 Kings 13-14. I, I thought this was interesting. This is, this is sometime later. Now Elisha, Elisha had fallen sick of his sickness... Of which he died, of which he died, and Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, "Oh my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof." And and this is kind of wrapping it up, but I want you to understand, Joash wasn't a good king. Joash had done some things right. Joash had done some things right. He he'd started some work to rebuild the temple because it was in it was in disrepair. Um, he did some things right, but he wouldn't get rid of he wouldn't get rid of the the pagan gods that were in his that his father had passed down to him, and he and he wasn't going to do it. And in fact, he had this wonderful he had this wonderful uh, this wonderful Levite priest that 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 mentored him as a child. He became king at like seven years old, and he was king for sixteen years. But um, this wonderful guy mentored him, but he passed away. His mentor passed away, and his son, the son of the of the mentor, became a, a Levite priest also, and came to Joash and said, "You got to tear down these these altars, man. You got a golden calf, all kinds of bad stuff. You need to stop doing this." And Joash had him killed. Joash had him killed because he came and told him the truth. So Joash isn't, you know, a really good guy, but it's interesting. He knows that Elisha's dying. And he knows enough about the scriptures that he knows that when Elijah was taken up, Elisha cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. See, there was not a prophet established after Elisha. There was nobody that he handed on to. There was other prophets, but there was no direct uh, baton handoff like between he and Elijah. And, and, and when Elisha saw Elijah go up, the heavens opened up. He got a revelation of God as his father. And he cries out, my father, my father. There was, a, there was a true heartfelt thing going on. Joash comes to him and he thinks if he says the words that he's going to become the prophet. See, and there's so many Christians today, they don't really have this in their heart. They've learned the words and that's part of the problem. They'll come up and they'll lay hands on you in the name of Jesus, by His blood, you are healed. By the stripes upon His back, you know, they'll know the Scriptures, but it's here, and it's not really here. They don't even really believe it. Joash probably didn't even really believe it. He was just trying. He knew the guy was dying. There was no other prophet established. I'll go in, I'll say the words he said, and I'll get what he got. No, he didn't get what he got. But instead, Elisha says to him, because I'm going to find out how serious you are about what you're saying. I'm going to find out just how serious you are what you're saying because I'm going to find out how serious you are about getting rid of these enemies of yours. See, and that's a question the church has to ask ourselves is how serious are we about praying for people? Are we serious enough to get rid of some of the gods that are in our lives? Some of the bad gods that are in our lives? Some of the evil things that are in our lives? How serious are we? How serious are we about taking on the enemy? How serious are we about taking on the demons? We read the story that one guy took on the demons uh, in Acts and, and, and he got beat up by the demons. The seven sons of Scythian got beat up. Sent them home naked. 
I don't know if you've had any encounters like that with a demon or not, but, but I don't think so because most of the church doesn't really fight the demons. Because we make a half-hearted effort. And when it doesn't work, we give up. We don't keep pressing in and pressing in and pressing in. And that's earlier I talked to you about the, the, about the arrow. And, and, and he says, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He said, I know the scriptures and I'm gonna, you're going to be taken up today and I want to be the next prophet. I want to be the next healer. You've got this history. It's incredible. You did twice of everything that Elijah did. So maybe I'll even do twice of everything you did. So I'm coming down and I'm saying the words. Christ said we do greater things than He would do and there's a whole lot of people that are just using the words. 2 Kings 13, 15-17 And Elisha said unto him, Take the bow and the arrows. And he took unto him the bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand upon the bow. Okay, pick up the bow. And then he put his hand upon Elisha's and Elisha put his, uh, put his hand upon the bow and Elisha put his hand upon the king's hand. So here we are together. You want, you want to be a prophet? You want this thing? The old father, oh father? Okay, let's see if you really want this thing. And, and Elisha grabbed the bow with him, put his hand right on. And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Now they're both holding the bow. He reaches over and he opens up the window eastward. It, it, I would guess there are a couple stories up at least. Maybe not. Maybe they're, maybe they're just right at the ground. I would hope there are a couple stories up because he's about to shoot an arrow. And the compound must have been a pretty big compound because it talks about that when, when we read earlier about Nahum coming, that, that he waited at the front gate while they went to get Elisha. So he's not like knocking on the door and Elisha's right on the other side of the door. So we're talking about probably a fairly sizable compound, but I don't know. But he says, open up that east window over there because that's where Syria is. That's where your enemy is. That's where the demons are. That's where Satan is. That's where your enemies are. Now remembering, Joash started to rebuild the temple. Started to restore the temple because it was, it was in, in, in uh, disarray. But he didn't get rid of the pagan gods. In fact, he refurbished the golden calf. And he said, The air of the Lord's deliverance and the air of deliverance from Syria, for you shall smite the Syrians in Apex till you have consumed them. So he says, You want to beat your enemies? You want to beat down the enemies that you've got? Then I'll hold hands with you. I'll hold this. I'll do this together with you. You pull the ball and you shoot eastward. And so he went to that window and I was talking about it earlier. He goes to that window and that was the tradition of that day. Is It's kind of a, I'm going to get you. I'm going to follow through with this. Because it would have gone around. The king, everybody known. Oh, the king, he just shot an arrow towards Syria. That means we're going to battle. <coughs> Excuse me. It means we're going to fight. I mean, the word would have spread all over. I just saw the king up there in Elisha's window and he shot an arrow and Elisha's hand was on his hand. Man, we're going to war. This is my attempt to strike Syria. And then it says in the next breath, and he says, and he said, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, strike the ground. Strike the ground. Now I want to I explain something I talked a little bit about earlier before we, we started taping is that that tradition within the church is that he had this quiver of arrows and he took the quiver of arrows and he struck the ground three times. That's what we're going to read in a second. But if you study, if you study the, that, that tradition of shooting the arrow towards your enemy, that what the real thing was is that you shoot the arrow towards your enemy and then based on your anger towards them, your intent towards them, your fervor towards them, your your commitment to following through with it, you shoot more arrows. So when it says strike the ground with the arrows, it's not talking about taking a bundle of arrows and hitting the ground, hitting the dirt. He's probably not even on the ground. He's probably up at a second story or something, looking out the east window. I hope he was, or otherwise when he shot, he might have hit somebody. But um, hopefully he just shot in the air to the east. But the tradition was you take the arrows and you shoot them. You shoot them. You shoot them. You shoot them at the ground. 
And although we've this this other idea has crept into the church of beating on them with the quiver of arrows or several arrows in your hand and hit it to the ground, that's not what it's about. What it's about is how serious are you? You just shot one to the east now, take the other ones and shoot to ground, shoot to ground, shoot to ground, shoot to ground. I'm serious about this. I'm not gonna let Satan continue to do this to my family. I'm not gonna let Satan continue to disrupt my life. I'm not gonna let Satan continue to keep me from receiving a healing. I'm ready to fight. But see, many of us, unfortunately, in the church today, and I'm not necessarily talking about our church, but many of us in the church at large are more like Joash. Is we keep a lot of our, our, our pagan gods around. We still worship things we shouldn't worship, and, and, and they're, they're too important to us. doesn't mean we have to get rid of them. We just have to quit worshiping them. And he struck three times and stopped. Now here's the interesting thing is Joash knew the tradition. This wasn't something new to him. He knew that his confidence level of being able to beat the Syrians was not really high. He comes in and he says, my father, my father, trying to get Elisha's anointing on him. Because he wants some sort of magic to try and do something because Elisha healed Nahum. Man, if I can do this kind of stuff, I, I'm in cool with everybody and I can, I'm a powerful wizard. And so he tries it with the words. But he says, then how serious are you about it? That's what he's really saying. How serious are you about it? Because you know where it begins? It begins on you winning the battles against the things that continually prevent you from being the Christian you're supposed to be. And how serious are you about fighting those battles? How serious are you about overcoming those things in your life? That's what he's saying. How serious are you about, about, about beating the Syrians? And he takes the arrows out and he shoots three arrows. I don't know with how much energy or whatever he did, but he shot three arrows to the ground as a demonstration of what we're going to do to these Syrian people. And the prophet says to him, the man of God who's angry with him, he got mad. He says, you come in here and you, cry, you start quoting scripture of what I said from my heart about Elijah when he went up. I lived with that guy for years. I gave up everything I had and I followed that guy day in and day out. Now watch what he did. And when we crossed the Jordan River that day, he said, what do you want? And he says, I want what you got. And he says, if you stick with me, you'll see it. If you don't, you won't. He says, you've asked a hard thing. See, the king comes in to Elisha and he's asking a hard thing when he says, my father, my father. He's saying, I want your anointing. He says, we'll see how bad you want my anointing. How serious are you about driving the enemies out of your life? How serious are you about, about destroying these neighbors that have been in dominance over you for so many years? This little girl we read about a few minutes ago that's a maid in Nahum's house, a, a, a mistress or a, na, a maid for Nahum's wife, she had some parents someplace. She had a mommy and a daddy someplace. It says she was a little girl. She was a young girl. I think of my granddaughter, uh, Emma, how she helps around the house. She comes and she does things for Margie. And she runs around the house. What is she? 10, 11 years old now. She's 11 years old. And, and for the last several years, she's just diligent. She's a good worker. She comes and she does things for my wife to, that, that we, we can't do or just help out. And how would I feel if, if somebody came and killed her dad and her mom and took her away to some foreign country? That's what, that's what Joash was facing. And he says, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, church? When are you going to get serious about this thing? When are you going to fight the devil seriously? When are you going to drive these things out of your life? He got angry with him. Don't come in here asking for the anointing of God from me while I'm laying here on my deathbed. Don't come in here and ask for that. You should have struck it five or six times 
Then you would have struck down Syria until you had consumed him, whereas now you shall strike down Syria but three times. Church, you're making a half you're making a half-hearted attempt at this. Now the church has got to stop being half-hearted about what they're doing. We're losing this nation. We're losing this generation. We're losing these children because we made a half-hearted attempt. And we don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't need to join the, the school board and I'm nothing against that. We don't need to join some political party. You know what we got to do is we've got to fight the devil. We've got to start fighting the devil. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. And they're walking all over us. Colossians 3, 23 and 24, I'm almost done. And whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, knowing that the Lord, knowing that of the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Do whatever you do with all your heart when you do things for God. Most of the time our heart's not even in it. We don't care about that sick person. We got our own troubles in our own life. God tells us to go pray for him. Well, I might get embarrassed. I'm not going to do that. It's not going to work anyhow. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. How many Christians are doing Jesus stuff with all their heart? We're the Pentecostals. We're the, we're the spirit-filled people. And, and, and we're kind of a little limp when it comes to that kind of stuff. And, and so where are the rest of the church? Where's the rest of the evangelical church that doesn't even believe this is for today? They're not even attempting it. They might say a little prayer and, and, and do some kumbayas and a little group hug. Hebrews 6.10 For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed towards His name so in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence for the full assurance of hope unto the end. See, God isn't missing this stuff. God knows what the church is doing. God knows about the, the little pastor in Mozambique that's running from village to village to try and bring people back from the dead and, and, and give them their sight back from blindness to unstop their ears so that their, so that their, uh, their tribe or their village would get saved. He sees that going on. Well, we big Christians in America, you know, we're we're pretty hot shots. We got big churches. We got all this wonderful praise and worship. We got records and CDs and DVDs and the internet and all this stuff. God doesn't miss this. He looks for this one line that says, "Every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope until the end." How diligent are we? How diligent? And I include myself. How diligent are we? John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say, you know, you know this scripture. Verily, verily, this is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. That's what Jesus is saying. I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he also, and greater works than they shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever you shall ask my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Remember, remember, uh, the king saying, oh, what is this? Why are they coming to me? I can't heal people. He says, you do these greater works than Jesus so that God gets glorified, not you. You might get embarrassed. You might get knocked down. You might get beat up. You might get rejected. You might get laughed at. That's not what it's about. He says, that whatever you shall ask in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. God is glorified through the power of Christ as the church represents Christ here on earth. And if we do a shoddy job of representing Christ here on earth, we do a we 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 shoot three little arrows and say, well, I said the words and you know, and now I want to do this. God says, Well, I'll give you some victories, but not much. Because you aren't you haven't got your heart into it. Have you got your heart into bringing glory to the name of Jesus Christ? Or are, you, are you tired of being mocked because you're a Christian? Are you tired of the rejection and the crud that we put up with from our political people and our, our enemies? Again, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but 
we got a whole bunch of people in this country that don't want Christianity. They'd rather have communism than Christianity. They'd rather have ultra-socialism than Christianity. And they're evil. They're evil and there, there is a conspiracy. There is a big conspiracy. And the conspiracy is this. There are people that are sold out to Satan. And they're sold out to his cause. They may not know that. They may not even realize it. But they're sold out to the cause that's against God. They're against God. They don't want God. They don't like God. They don't want God telling them what to do. And they'll go to hell for it. But they're, they're riding roughshod over the church. And what are we doing? What are we doing? We're not fighting the, the devil like we should be fighting. When you're tempted to, when you're tempted to do what you shouldn't do, when you're tempted to back away, when you're tempted to, to, to walk away from an opportunity to, to share the gospel, when you, when you're tempted to walk away from that opportunity to, to share the gospel with somebody or, or, or pray for a healing for somebody, when you're tempted to, to go and do what you know you shouldn't do, get out your arrows. Get out your arrows. Shoot one towards Satan. Say, I'm not going to put up with this. Not from you or from your demons either. I mean, start, start picking your places and taking a stand. We don't even have to pray. We got tongues. We can, we can pray in tongues. We don't even know what to pray about. We can do that with some energy and some effort, some art. I sometimes think we find ourselves in all kinds of trying situations, and, and I, I begin to think, how, how bad does it have to get before I start fighting? Not the person, but the devil. How bad is it going to get before I start fighting? And that's, what, that's what's got to go on in the church. How bad is it going to get before we... Do we have to go through Hitler kind of, kind of suffering? Do we need to go through uh, uh, what Christ went through and what the apostles went through? How far do we have to go before we begin to stand up for Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord, our King, our Master? John 16, 13 through 14 says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine, and shall show it unto you. Remember Jesus said, I don't do anything except for I see the Father do it in heaven? Here He's telling us, don't do anything unless you, the Holy Spirit tells you what to do. Do you see that? And the, you know the reason that is? Because see, if you do it out of your own reasoning, well, I can wash in any river in Damascus. What do I got to wash in the Jordan River for? See, if, if we listen to the Holy Spirit, we respond to the Holy Spirit, we do what the Holy Spirit says to do, then Jesus gets the glory, not us. Jesus came to glorify the Father. The Spirit comes to glorify Jesus Christ. And the way He does it is through the church, operating through the church. And I've got to be honest with you, right now in the United States, Jesus Christ is not getting much glory from His church. Because we have got the gods just like Joash has. Yeah, we're trying to rebuild the church. We're trying to, we're trying to recover the temple. Restore the temple a little bit. We're trying to recover from the, the 60s and the free sex and all that. We're trying. We're, we're involved in political parties. We're trying to get our politicians elected. We're trying to recover from the fact that we're murdering babies in the, in the womb at an at incredible rate, whatever it is. We kill more Americans than all of our enemies combined. When are we going to start fighting that stuff? When are we going to stop, stop being half-hearted? This is my job. This is my, this is my responsibility. Ephesians 4.11 He gave them to some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't think we're a perfect man yet. We're still in the training, though. And it says, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be teaching you this stuff. 
And that's what I'm showing you. And I believe the Holy Spirit showed me this scripture, these scriptures today for the people that are here today. And I believe with all my heart that, that we're to have a boldness, a holy boldness that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes from our relationship with the Holy Spirit. It comes from us hearing what the Holy Spirit says. What was that previous verse? Go back to the previous verse and it says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. This is Jesus speaking before the Holy Spirit's come at Pentecost. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Just as Jesus looked to God for what he was to do on a daily basis, that was our example. And he says, now you look to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will tell you what to do and what to think. But he says, if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, how are you going to get it? How are you going to get it if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit? If you're not spending time with the Holy Spirit, if you're spending time with all your gods and all the things that you've made important in this world and you're not willing to give them up no more than Joash was able to give up those pagan gods. We think, oh gosh, why did he give up those pagan gods? It was part of their, it was part of their culture. And we, we're caught in these things that are part of our culture and, and we're not willing to give them up because we don't even know what we're supposed to give up. We don't even know who we're battling. So, I just say all this to say that uh, it's time for us to decide whether they're going to start shooting some more arrows at the ground. We got our enemy targeted. There's no doubt about that. We're not out there, and I don't mean to be critical of the Baptists and, and all those other, those other denominations that don't believe that we're in this fight. You know, but, it, but we're in a fight. We're in a real life fight, and we need to. We need. It's not a. It's not a fight for more people, food, fun, and fellowship. It's a fight for a, against an enemy. It's a fight against an enemy. Father God, I praise you and I thank you and I give you the glory for you're worthy of all praise and honor, and we worship you and thank you in the name of Jesus Christ that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, will continue to input into this church. This church, this, this group of people here, that you will continue to put into us that desire, Father God, to be more than we are. To be more of what you are and less of what we are. Father, we praise you and give you the glory in Jesus Christ's name. Amen? Amen. Amen.